Section four of the Diary of a U Boat Commander. We laid our minds without trouble at five AM this morning, though at midnight we had a most unpleasant experience. I was asleep, as it was my morning watch, when I was wakened by the harsh rattle of the diving alarms. The diesel subsided with a few spasmodic coughs into silence, and as I jumped out of my bunk and groped for my short sea boots, the navigator and helmsman came tumbling down the conning tower, with the navigator shouting, Take her down! As hard as you like. The men at the planes had them hard to dive in an instant. The vents had been opened as the hooters sounded, and Alton, who had jumped into the control room, immediately rang down, all out on the electric motors. In thirty seconds from the original alarm we were at an angle of twenty degrees down by the bow, and I had sat down heavily on the battery boards, completely surprised by the sudden tilt of the deck. It occurred to me that the air was escaping through the vents with a strangely loud noise, but before I could consider the matter further, or even inquire the reason for this sudden dive, the noise increased to a terrifying extent, and whilst I prepared myself for the worst, it culminated into a roar as of fifty express trains going through a tunnel, mingled with the noise of a high-powered aeroplane engine. The roar drummed and beat and shook the boat, then died away as suddenly as it came. A moment later there was a severe jar. We had struck the bottom, still maintaining our angle. I painfully got to my feet, and then discovered from the navigator that we had suddenly seen two white patches of foam eight hundred yards on the starboard bow, which resolved themselves into the bow waves of a destroyer approaching at full speed to ram. We had dived just in time, and her knife-edged bow, driven by thirty thousand horsepower, had slid through the water a very few feet above our conning tower. Luckily he had not dropped any depth charges. We were not, however, completely free of our troubles, though we had cheated the destroyer. Examination of the chart showed the bottom to be mud, and on attempting to move the foremost hydroplanes, the plane motor fuses blew out. This showed that the boat was buried in the mud right up to her foremost planes, which were immovable. The hydrophone watchkeeper reported that he could still hear fast-running propellers, though probably some distance away, and as this showed that our old enemy was still nosing about, we were very anxious not to break surface. We just blew A. Footnote. Probably their foremost internal tank. End of footnote. At least we started to blow A, but Alton wisely decided that, as it was a calm night with a half-moon, the bubbles on the surface might be rather conspicuous, so we stopped the blow and put the pump on. We also flooded W, footnote 2, presumably their after-internal tank, and a footnote. This had no effect on her at all. We then pumped out Q and P, leaving W full and adjusted our trim to give her only three tons negative buoyancy, just enough to keep us on the bottom if she came out of the mud. In this position we went full speed astern on the motors, fifteen hundred amps on each, and all the crew in the after compartment. No result. We then pumped the outer diving tanks on the port side to give her a list to starboard. Still she remained fixed. So at two a.m. we decided to risk it, and we put a slow blow on all tanks. When she had about fifty tons positive buoyancy, she suddenly bucketed up, and as the motors were running full speed astern at the time, we came up and broke surface stern first. In a few seconds we were trimmed down again, and as a precautionary measure we proceeded for a couple of miles at twenty meters, when, coming up to periscope depth, we surfaced. In finding all clear, we proceeded. We were put down by a trawler at dawn, though she never saw us. After half an hour's hanging about she moved off, which was lucky, as she was right on our billet. We are now proceeding to a spot somewhat to the eastward of Cape St. Abbs. Footnote 3. St. Abbs Head. End of footnote. As we have instructions to do a two days patrol here and sink shipping. We ought to start business tomorrow morning. New Entry We should be in tonight, then for my little Zoe. But I must record what we have done. Already I am getting much pleasure from reading my diary. 
Strange how it amuses one to see little bits of oneself on paper, and the less garnished and franker the truths, the more entertaining it is. The hours here are so long and boring at times that I feel I want to talk intimately with someone. Failing Zoe, I turn to my notebooks. The first steamer we sighted raised high hopes. At least her smoke did, for we saw enough smoke on the horizon to make us think we were to see the Grand Fleet, and we promptly dived. We cruised towards her for about half an hour, and then hung about where we were, as we found that her course would take the ship close to us. As the situation developed, Alton, who was up in the conning tower at the A periscope, gave us a certain amount of information, and we gathered that all this smoke was pouring out of the pipe-stem funnel of a wretched little English tramp. I found it most irritating, standing in the control room, my action station, and not knowing what was going on. There is only one good job in a submarine, and that is the captain's. He knows and decides everything. The rest of us are in his hands, and take things on trust. I object on principle to my life being held in Alton's hands. It is all very well for the crew, for to start with, they have no imagination, and to most of them their mental horizon stops at the walls of the boat. Secondly, they have the consolation of mechanical activities. They make and break switches and open and close valves. They work with their hands. An officer has imagination, and only works with his head. As we attacked the steamer, all one heard was murmurs from Alton, such as, Raise, lower, take her down to ten meters, half speed, slow, bring her up to five meters, raise, lower. I endeavored to simulate an air of unconcern which I was far from feeling. Not that I was a prey to physical fear, I flatter myself that it is so far unknown to me, and there was no great danger, but simply that I longed to know what was happening. At length I heard the welcome order, Starboard tube, stand by, which was followed almost immediately by the order, Fire. There was a kind of coughing grunt, and the starboard torpedo proceeded on its errand of destruction. Every ear was strained for the sound of the explosion, but all we were vouchsafed was a torrent of blasphemy from Alton. The torpedo had jumped clean out of the water a hundred yards short of the steamer, and had then evidently dived under the ship. So I gathered later when Alton had calmed down somewhat. We were about to surface and give her the gun, when luckily Alton took a good sweep round with a skyscraper, and discovered one of those wretched little airships about a mile away coming towards the steamer, which was wailing piteously on her siren. As the chart showed forty meters, we decided to bottom and have lunch. Over lunch we discussed the misadventure. Alton was loud in his curses of Tanzerman, the torpedo lieutenant at Bruges, from whom he had got the torpedo in guaranteed good condition only forty-eight hours before we sailed. He launched forth into a tirade against the torpedo staff at Bruges, and, warming to his subject, he roundly abused the whole of the depot personnel, whom he stigmatized as a set of hard-drinking, shore-loafing ruffians, who were incapable of realizing that they existed for the benefit of the boat's personnel and material. I naturally disagreed, and did so the more readily that I conscientiously disagree with him. I find that there is a tendency on the part of some of these submarine officers who have been U-boating a long time, to get into narrow grooves. Most reserve officers are not like this, as they have only been in during the war. Alton is an exception. He left the Hamburg America on two years' half pay in 1912, and was, of course, kept on in 1914. After all, the depot staff are Germans, and as such labor for the fatherland and though their work in office and workship is not so dangerous as ours, on the other hand they have not got the stimulation before their eyes of glory to be gained. Personally I am of the opinion that the torpedo broke surface because, having fired from the outside tubes, it probably started too shallow, dived deep, recovered shallow and dived deep, broke surface and dived very deep. A sticky motor or sluggish weight would give this effect. 
And are these external tubes watertight? Theoretically, yes, but what of practice? We have been down to forty meters several times during this trip, and not once have we had a chance on the surface of getting at the two external tubes, add to which our depth gear, with the pivots of the weight exposed to water if the tube does flood, and then you have rust, corrosion, and heaven knows what complications. I saw a British Mark 11-50 torpedo at the torpedo shop at Bruges the other day, and I was much struck with their deep depth gear, which is of the unrestrained Uhlan type, i.e., weight and valve interdependent. But then the main feature is that the whole gear is contained in a separate watertight chamber. Our system is certainly a great saving in space, and is much neater in design, whilst I prefer the Uhlan principle of valve conjuncting with weight, but it would be interesting to know whether the British have much trouble with the depth-keeping of their torpedo. I have written quite a disquisition on depth gears. I must get on with my record of events. After lunch we had a good look around, but the small airship was still hanging about, flying slowly in large circles. We were rather surprised to meet one of these despicable little sausages, or zeppelin spawn as the navigator calls them, so far from land, and at dark we surfaced and proceeded on one engine on an easterly course, charging the battery right up with the other engine. Dawn revealed a blank horizon, not a vestige of mast, funnel, or smoke in sight. We ambled along in fine though cold weather, and I took advantage of the peacefulness of everything to do a really good series of Muller on the upper deck, stripped to the waist, and allowed the keen air to play its invigorating currents on my torso. Alton silently watched me from the conning tower, with a sneering expression on his face. The navigator, who is quite a decent youngster, though of no family, was, I could plainly see, struck by my development and asked to be initiated into the series of exercises. I agreed willingly enough to show them to him. I will confess I wish Zoe could have seen me as I perspired with healthy exercise. At about eleven a.m. a couple of masts, then two more, then another, appeared above the horizon. The visibility was extreme, so we at once dived and proceeded at full speed, ten meters. We had been going thus for perhaps half an hour when Alton remarked that he would have another look at the convoy. We eased speed, came up to six meters, and Alton proceeded up into the conning tower to use a periscope. He had hardly applied his eye to the lens when he sharply ordered the boat to ten meters, accompanying this order with another to the motor room demanding utmost speed. Auserstkraft. I went up to the conning tower and found him white with excitement. Look! he exclaimed, pointing to the periscope, entirely forgetful of the fact that we were at ten meters. I looked and of course saw nothing. Furious at the trick I considered he had played on me, I turned on him, to be disarmed by his apology. Sorry, I forgot. The whole British battle cruiser force is there. It was now my turn to be excited, and I rushed down to the motor room, determined to give her every amp she would take. The port foremost motor was sparking like the devil, rings of cursed sparks shooting round the commutator, but this was no time for ceremony. I relentlessly ordered the field current to be still further reduced. We were actually running with an FC of 3.75 amps. Footnote. The lower the field current, the faster the motor goes. 3.75 is almost incredibly low for a motor of this type at least according to British practice. Signed, Etienne. End of footnote. For a period when the sparking assumed the appearance of a ring of fire, and, fearing a commutator strip would melt, I ordered an F.C. of five amps. We thus passed a quarter of an hour full of strain, the tension of which was reflected in the attitude of all the men. Alton had announced his intention of using the stern torpedo tube after his failure in the morning and the crew of this tube were crouched at their stations like a gun's crew in the last few seconds preparatory to opening fire. The switchboard attendants gripped the regulating rheostats as if by their personal efforts they could urge the boat on faster. Old Schmidt, at the helm, never lifted his eyes from the compass repeater. At length, 
Slow both. Bring her to six meters. Came from the conning tower, to which place I proceeded to hear the news. Slowly the periscope was raised, and I held my breath. A groan came from Alton, and he turned away. For a fraction of a second I was almost pleased at his obvious pain. Then, sick with disappointment, I took his place. Yes, it was all over. There they were and with hungry eyes and depressed heart I saw five great battle-cruisers, of which I recognized the Tiger with her three great funnels, the Princess Royal, Lion, and two others, zigzagging along at twenty-five knots, at a distance of twelve thousand meters, across our bow. They were surrounded by a numerous screen of destroyers and light cruisers, the former at that range through the periscope appearing as black smudges. It is not often one is permitted such a spectacle in modern war, and I could not tear myself away from the sight of those great brutes whom I had fought when in the Durflinger at Dogger Bank, and again when in the Koenig at Jutland. So near, and yet so far, and as they rapidly drew away so did all the visions of an iron cross. As soon as they were out of sight, we surfaced in order to report what we had seen to Siebrugge and Heligoland. Everything seemed against us. I had gone on the bridge with the navigator. Alton, with a face as black as hell, had gone to the wardroom. About ten minutes elapsed when I heard a fearful altercation going on below. I stepped down to find the young wireless operator trembling in front of Alton, who was overwhelming him with a flood of abuse. As I reached the wardroom, Alton shook his fist in the man's face and bellowed, Make the damn thing work, I tell you. Impossible, Captain. The main condenser— The man began. Purple with rage, Alton seized a heavy pair of parallel rulers, and before I could check him, hurled them full in the operator's face. Bleeding copiously, the youth fell to the deck in a stunned condition. It was then, for the first time, that I noticed a half-empty bottle of spirits on the table, which colossal quantity he must have consumed in about a quarter of an hour. Turning to me, this semi-madman pointed to the wireless operator with his foot and growled, "'Have him removed!' This I did, and then, lowering the periscope, I ordered the boat to fifteen meters. We proceeded at this depth until eight p.m., when I was informed that the captain was in his bunk and wished to see me. I discovered him with his face to the ship's side, and upon my reporting myself he ordered me— firstly to throw that blasted bottle overboard, an unnecessary proceeding as it was empty, and secondly to surface and shape course for Zeebrugge. At midnight he relieved me, apparently perfectly normal. The wireless operator has been laid up all day, and has a nasty cut on the head. The navigator, a great scandal-monger, has heard from the engineer that Alton was speaking to him alone this morning, and the engineer believes that Alton has given him five hundred marks to say he fell down a hatch. Hooray! Blankenberg buoy has just been reported in sight. Soon I shall see my Zoe. New Entry With what high hopes did I write the last few lines a few hours ago, and how they were dashed to the ground, for on going into the mess at Bruges I found amongst my letters a note from her, which was terrible in its brevity. She simply said, "'Dear Carl, I am going away for some days, and as I shall be travelling it is no good giving you an address. To our next meeting. Zoe.' How horribly vague! Not an indication of her destination, her object, or the probable length of her absence. Of course I rushed round to the flat, but found the place shut up. The porter told me she had gone away with her maid. He couldn't say when she'd be back if at all. I gave him ten marks, and he said she might be away a fortnight. If I'd given him twenty, he'd have said a week. He obviously didn't know. I feel I could do anything to-night. Any mad, evil thing would appeal to me. There is a most fearful uproar coming from the guest-room, where a large and rowdy party are entertaining the chorus of a travelling review company. I saw them when they arrived, horribly common-looking women, with legs like mine-tubes. New Entry Another day, and still no news. I don't know how I shall stick it. She might have had the softness of heart to write to me. 
She knows my address. This evening a letter from the little mother, who asks whether I can find time to go to Frankfurt when I have leave. At the end of the letter she mentions that Rosa has joined the Women's Voluntary Auxiliary Corps of Army Nurses. I suppose she thought she'd like her photograph taken in some fancy uniform as Rosa Freinland, one of our Frankfurt beauties, now on war work. Holding the patient's hand is about the only work she intends doing. Women as a class are the same the world over. We are well supplied with English papers in the mess here. They come regularly from Amsterdam, and in their pages I see, just as in ours, pictures of the Countess this and the Lord that, photographed in becoming attitudes doing war work. It seems agricultural pursuits are the fashion in England at present. Wait till our U-boat war gets its knife well into their fat guts. It will be more than fashionable to work in the fields then. The British Empire is undeniably a great creation or rather not so much a creation as a thing arrived at accidentally, but it lacks solidarity. It sprawls, a confused mass of races and creeds, around the world. Its very immensity lays it open to attack. It has a dozen Achilles' heels from Ireland to Egypt and South Africa to India. I met a man only yesterday who was recently at the propaganda department of the Foreign Office and without going into details he gave me a very good idea of the good work that is going on in Britain's canker spots. Ireland is considered particularly promising to those in the know. Now for an agitated night, to think that a girl should disturb me so. Section 5 of The Diary of a U-Boat Commander Two days have passed, or rather dragged their interminable links away, for there is still not a vestige of news. I have been twice to the flat with no result, except to receive a piece of impertinence from the porter the last time I was there. No news. New entry. Still no news, and we sail in forty-eight hours. At sea, off the Isle of Wight. It is some days since I turned for solace and enjoyment, amidst the discomforts of this life, to my pen and notebook. What strange tricks fate plays with us, and how lucky it is that one cannot foresee the future! Here I am in U-39, but I must start at the beginning. My last entry was the depressing one of still no news. Well, I have had news, but it was like a drop of water in the mouth of a parched-up man. Another agonizing twenty-four hours passed, and I was sitting in my room about ten o'clock, trying to resign myself to the idea that the next night I should be starting out for my third trip without news of her, when the telephone bell rang. I lifted the receiver, and to my amazed joy heard a voice that I could have recognized in a thousand. It was Zoe. I was quite incapable of any remark, and my confusion was further increased when, after a few hellos, which I idiotically repeated, her clear, level tone said, is that you, Carl? How are you? How was I? What a question to ask! I wanted to tell her that I was bubbling with joy, that a thousand kilogram load had been lifted from my chest, that my blood was coursing through my veins, that I, usually so cool, was trembling with excitement, that I could have kissed the mouthpiece of the humble instrument that linked us together. Yet I was quite incapable of answering her simple question. I can't imagine what I expected her to say, for upon reflection her remark was a very ordinary one, and indeed under the circumstances quite natural, but, as I say, in actual fact I was tongue-tied. I suppose I might have said something, for I next remember her saying, Well, you might ask how I am, and to my horror I realized that she thought I was being rude. My abject apologies were cut short by her tantalizing laugh, and I understood that the adorable one was teasing me. When at length I made myself believe that I really was talking to this most elusive and delightful woman, I wasted no time in suggesting that, late though it was, I might be permitted to go round and see her. She would not permit this, as she said it would create grave scandal, and the Colonel might hear about it upon his return. I pleaded hard, and urged my departure in twenty-four hours. 
She was firm and reproved me for discussing movements over the telephone. She was right. I was a fool to do so. But Zoe destroys all my caution. However, she said that I might lunch with her next day, and that she had some new music to play to me. I ventured to ask where she had been, but this question was plainly unpleasing to my lady, so I dropped the subject. I blew her a good-night kiss over the telephone, to which I think I caught an answer, and then she rang off. Ten minutes had not elapsed when a messenger entered and informed me that I was wanted at the Commodore's office at once. A strange feeling of uneasiness and that of impending misfortune overcame me. I felt like a naughty schoolboy about to interview the headmaster. I followed the messenger into the Commodore's office and found myself alone with the great man. He was seated at a huge roll-top desk, which was the only article of furniture in a room which was, to all intents and purposes, papered with large-scale charts of the east and south coast of England and of the Channel and North Sea. The Commodore was sealing an envelope as I came in. He looked up and saw me. Then, without taking any further notice of me, he resumed his business with the envelope. I felt that I was in the presence of a personality, and I was, for old man Max is one of the ten men who count in the naval administration. He had a reading lamp on his desk, and I remember noticing that the light shining through its green shade imparted a yellow parchment-like effect to the top of his old bald head. With dainty care he finished sealing the envelope, then, picking up a telephone transmitter, he snapped, Admiralty. In about a minute he was connected, and to my astonishment I realized that he was talking to the duty captain of the operations department in Berlin. His words chilled my heart, for he said, Commodore speaking, U-39 sails at 2 a.m. for Operation F.Q.H. Repeat. His words were apparently repeated to his satisfaction. For while I was vainly endeavouring to convince myself that I was unconnected with the sailing of U-39, he banged the receiver into place. Old man Max does everything in bangs, and snapped at me, "'You, Lieutenant von Schenk?' I admitted I was, then heard this disgusting news. Kranz, 1st Lieutenant U-39, reported suddenly ill. Seabrugge, poisoning. You relieve him. Ship sails in one hour forty minutes from now. My car leaves here in forty minutes and takes you to Zeebrugge. Here are operation orders. Inform von Weissmann he acknowledges receipt direct to me on phone. That's all. He handed me the envelope, and I suppose I walked outside. At least I found myself in the corridor, turning the confounded envelope round and round. For one mad moment I felt like rushing in and saying, but, sir, you don't understand I'm lunching with Zoe tomorrow. Then the mental picture which this idea conjured up made me shake with suppressed laughter, and I remembered that war was war, and that I had only thirty-five minutes in which to collect such gear as I had handy, most of my sea things being a new C-47, and say good-bye to Zoe. I ran to my room, and made the corridors echo with shouts for my faithful Adolf. The excellent man was soon on the scene, and whilst he stuffed underclothing, towels, and other necessary gear into a bag he had purloined from someone's room, I rang up Zoe. I wasted ten minutes getting through, but at last I heard a deliciously sleepy voice murmur, "'Who's that?' I told her, and added that I was off. To my secret joy, and intensely disappointed, and long-drawn, "'Ooh!' came over the wire. So she does care a bit, I thought. Mad ideas of pretending to be suddenly ill crossed my mind, anything to gain twenty-four hours. But the fatherland is above all such considerations, and after some pleasant talk and many wishes of good luck from the darling girl, with a heavy heart I bade her good night. The old man's car, which is a sixty-horsepower Benz, was waiting at the mess entrance, and once clear of the sentries we raced down the flat, well metalled road to Zeebrugge in a very short time. The guard at Bruges Barrier had phoned us through to the Zeebrugge fortified zone, and we were admitted without delay. 
In three quarters of an hour from my interview with old Max, I was scrambling across a row of U-boats to reach my new ship, U-39. I went down the after hatch, reported myself to von Weissmann, and delivered his orders to him, of which he acknowledged receipt direct to the Commodore according to instructions. Von Weissmann is a very different stamp of man to Alton. Of medium height, he has sandy-coloured hair, steel-grey eyes, and a protruding jaw. He is what he looks, a fine North Prussian, and is of course of excellent family, as the Weissmanns have been settled in Grinets for a long period. He struck me as being about thirty years of age, and on his heart he wore the cross of the second class. I have heard of him before, as being well in the running towards an ordre pour le mérite. An interesting chart is hanging in the wardrobe, on which is marked the last resting place of every ship he has sunk. He puts a coloured dot, the tint of which varies with the tonnage, black up to two thousand, blue from two thousand to five thousand, brown five thousand to eight thousand, green eight thousand to eleven thousand, and a red spot with a ship's name for anything over eleven thousand. He has got about a hundred and twenty thousand tons at present. He opposes the Arnold de la Perriere school of thought, which pins faith on the gun, and Weissman has done nearly all his work with a good old torpedo. Altogether, undoubtedly a man to serve with. The U-39 was in that buzzing and semi-active condition which to a trained eye is a sure indication that the ship is about to sail. Punctually at five minutes to two a.m., Weissman went to the bridge and at 2 a.m. the wires were slipped, and we started on a ten days' trip. As the dim lights on the mole disappeared, and the ceaseless fountain of star-shells, mingling with the flashing of guns, rose inland on our port beam, my mind travelled overland to the flat at Bruges, and I wondered whether Zoe was lying awake, listening to the ceaseless rumble of the Flanders cannon. We went on at full speed as it was our intention to pass the Dover Straits before dawn. Though our Intelligence Bureau issues the most alarming reports as to the frightfulness of the defences here, I was agreeably surprised at the ease with which we passed. Von Weissmann, to whom I had hinted that we might find the passage tricky, rather laughed at my suggestion, and described to me his method, which, at all events, has the merit of simplicity. He always goes through with the tide, so as to take as short a time as possible, and he always decides on a course and steers it as closely as possible, keeping to the surface unless he sights anything, and diving as soon as anything shows up. Even if he dives he goes on as fast as possible on his course, irrespective of whether he is being bombed or not. I must say it worked very well last night. We shaped a course to pass five miles west of Grignay, and when that light, which for some reason the French had commodiously lit that night, was a beam, we sighted a black object, probably a trawler or destroyer, about half a dozen miles away right ahead. Weissman immediately dived and, without deviating a degree from his course, held on at three-quarters speed on the motors. Some time later the hydrophone watchkeeper reported the sound of propellers in his listeners, and that he judged them to be close at hand so I imagine we passed very nearly directly underneath whatever it was. After an hour's submerging we rose, and found dawn breaking over a leaden and choppy sea. Nothing being in sight, we continued on the surface for an hour, charging batteries with a starboard engine, five hundred amps on each. But at nine a.m., the clouds lying low and an aerial patrol being frequent hereabouts, we dived and cruised steadily down channel at slow speed, keeping periscope depth. Several times in the course of the forenoon we sighted small destroyers and convoy craft in the distance. Footnote 1. Probably P-boats. End of footnote. All steering westerly. They were probably returning from escorting troop ships over to France last night. In every case we went to sixty feet long before they could have seen our stick. Footnote 2 periscope. End of footnote. 
Weissman is evidently as cautious in this matter as he is hardy in others. The more I see of him, the more I like him. He is a man of breeding, and it is of value to serve in this boat. As I write, we are on the surface about ten miles east of the Isle of Wight, still steering down channel. Tonight at midnight we report our position to Zeebrugge. Up till now we have maintained wireless silence, for fear of the British and French directional stations picking up our signals and fixing our position. After supper this evening, von Weissmann explained to me the general plan of our operations for the next eight days. Our cruising billet is about 150 miles southwest of the Scillies, at the focal point where trade for Liverpool and Bristol and the up-channel trade diverges. Von Weissmann says that this is a plum billet, and we should do well. I feel this is going to be better than those piffling little mine-laying trips, and though we shall be away ten days, it will qualify me for four days' leave in Belgium. New Entry There was nearly an awkward moment last night, or, rather, there was an awkward moment and nearly an awkward accident. I relieved the navigator at midnight. The pilot is an unassuming individual called Siegel and took on the middle watch. It was blowing about force four from the southwest, and a nasty short, lumpy sea was running which caught us just on the port bow. About once every ten seconds she missed her step with the waves, and, dipping her nose into it, shoveled up tons of water, which, as the bow lifted, raced aft, and, breaking against the gun, flung itself in clouds of spray against the bridge. In a very few minutes every exposed portion of me was streaming with water. At about 2 a.m. I had turned my back to the sea for a moment, and my thoughts were for an instant in Bruges, when, on facing forward once again, I saw a sight which effectually brought me back to earth. This was the spectacle of two black shapes, evidently steamers, one on either bow, distant, I should estimate, 600 or 700 meters. I had to make a quick decision, and I decided that to fire a torpedo in that sea, with any hope of a hit, especially with a boat on surface, was useless. Furthermore, that at any moment either of the steamers might sight us from their high bridge and turn and ram. These thoughts were the work of an instant, and I at once rang the diving bell, and, pushing the lookout before me, in five seconds I was in the conning tower and had the hatch down. I at once proceeded down into the boat, and the first thing that struck my eye was the diving gauge with the needle practically stationary at two meters. The boat was not going down properly, and for an instant I was rudely shaken, until a cool voice from the wardroom remarked, Helm hard a port, an order that was instantly obeyed, and as she began to turn the moving needle on the depth gauge began its journey round the dial. It was the captain who had spoken. As soon as they heard the diving alarm he was out of his bunk, and a glance at the gauge he has fitted in the wardroom told him we were not sinking rapidly. In an instant he had put his finger on the trouble, which was that we were almost head-on to the sea, with the result that he had given the order as stated above, which, bringing us beam on to the sea, had caused her to dive with ease. He is efficiency itself. As I explained to him what had happened, the noise of propellers at varying distances from us overhead led him to state his belief that we had run into a convoy homeward bound to Southampton from the Atlantic. He approved of my actions in every particular, save only in my omission to bring the boat away from the sea as I began to dive. This morning we are beginning to get the full force of what is evidently going to be a southwesterly gale of some violence. The seas are getting larger as we debouch into the Atlantic. This looks bad for business. New Entry At the moment we are practically hove to on the surface, with the port engine just jogging to keep her head on to sea, and the starboard ticking round to give her a long, slow charge of two hundred amps. The wind is forced seven to eight and a very big sea is running which makes it entirely impossible to open the conning tower hatch. The engine is getting its air through the special mushroom ventilator. 
which is apparently not designed to supply both the boat's requirements and those of the engine, and the whole ventilator gets covered with sea every now and then, during which period, until the baffle drains get the water away, no air can get in, so the engine has a good suck at the air in the boat, and the result of all this being a slight vacuum in the boat. It is a very unpleasant sensation, and made me very sick. This is really a form of sickness due to the rarefied air. I had a great surprise when I looked at the barograph this morning, as the needle had gone right off the paper at the bottom, and at first glance I thought we had struck a tropical depression of the first magnitude, which, flouting all the laws of meteorology, had somehow found its way to the English Channel. But the engineer explained to me that, as I have already stated, the low atmospheric pressure in the boat was due to the conning tower hatch being shut down. I have discovered that von Weissmann is a martyr to seasickness. All day he has been lying down as white as a sheet, and subsisting on milk tablets and sips of brandy. Yet such is the man's inflexibility of will that he forces himself to make a tour of inspection right round the boat every six hours, night and day. It is this will to conquer which has made Germans unconquerable. Though come the four corners of the world in arms against us, as the great poet says. We are, of course, keeping watch from inside the conning tower. It is at all events dry, but as to seeing anything one might as well be looking out through a small glass window from inside a breakwater, to bed till 4 a.m. New Entry A most unprofitable day. I grudge every day away from Zoe on which we do nothing. This morning about noon the gale blew itself out, but a heavy, confused sea continued to run. At 2 p.m. we saw a most tantalizing spectacle. A big tank steamer, fully 600 feet long and of probably 17,000 tons burthen, hove in sight, escorted by two destroyers. To attack with the gun was impossible, as we could only keep the conning tower open when stern to sea and in any case the two destroyers prevented any surface work. We tried to get in for an attack, but we had not seen her in time, and the best we could do was to get within three thousand yards, at which range it would have been absurd to have wasted a torpedo, the chances of hitting being a hundred to one against, even if the torpedo had run properly in the sea that was on. I had a good look at her through the foremost periscope in between the waves and it maddened me to see all that oil, doubtless from Tampico for the Grand Fleet, going safely by. The destroyers were having a bad time of it, crashing into the sea like porpoises, their funnels white with salt, and their bridges enveloped in sheets of water and spray. They little thought that, barely a mile away, amidst the tumbling, crested waves, a German eye was watching them. There is no doubt these damn British have pluck, for it was the last sort of weather in which one would have expected to find destroyers at sea, and yet I suppose they do this throughout the winter. After all, one would expect them to be tough fellows, they are of Teutonic stock, though by their bearing one might imagine that the Creator made an Englishman, and then Adam. Let's hope we get some decent weather tomorrow. I have just been refreshing my memory by reading of what I wrote in the book concerning the day in the forest with the adorable girl. There is an exquisite pleasure in transporting the mind into such memories of the past, when the body is in such surroundings as the present, if only I could will myself to dream of her. New Entry A fine day, in every sense of the word. The weather has been and remains excellent and I have been present at my first sinking. It was absurdly commonplace. At ten a.m. this morning a column of smoke crept upwards from the southern horizon. Von Weissmann steered towards it on the surface until two masts and the top of a funnel appeared. We dived and proceeded slowly under water on a southerly course. Half an hour passed, and Von Weissmann brought the boat up to periscope depth and had a look. He called to me to come and see, an invitation I accepted with alacrity. With natural excitement I looked through the periscope, and there she was, unconsciously ambling to her doom like a fat sheep. 
She was a steamer, British, of about four thousand tons, slugging home at a steady ten knots, but she was destined to come to her last mooring place ahead of scheduled time. We dipped our periscope, and I went forward to the tubes. Five minutes elapsed, and the order instrument bell rang, the pointer flicking to stand by. I personally removed the firing gear safety pin, and put the repeat to ready. A breathless pause. Then a slight shake and destruction was on its way, whilst I realized by the angle of the boat that Weissman was taking us down a few meters. That shows his coolness. He didn't even trouble to watch his shot. Anxiously, I watched the second hand of my stopwatch. Weissman had told me the range would be about five hundred meters. Thirty seconds. Thirty-one. Thirty-two. Thirty-three. Has he missed? Thirty-four. Thirty-five. Thirty... A dull rumble comes through the water, and the whole boat shakes. Hurrah! We have hit! and the order, surface, comes along the voice-pipe. The cheerful voice of the blower is heard, evacuating the tanks. I run to the conning tower, and closely follow Weissman up the ladder. At last I am on the bridge. There she is! What a sight! I feel that I shall never forget what she looked like, though, if all goes well, I shall see many another fine ship go to her grave. But she was my first. I felt the same sensation when, as a boy, I shot my first roe-deer in the black forest, one instant a living thing beautiful to perfection, the next my rifle spoke, and a bleeding carcass lay beneath the fine trees. So with this ship. I am a sailor, and to every sailor every ship that floats has, as it were, a soul, a personality, an entity. To carry the analogy further, a merchant craft is like some fat beast of utility, an ox, a cow, or a sheep, whilst a warship is a lion if she is a battleship, a leopard if she is a light cruiser, etc., in all cases worthy game. But war has little use for sentimentality, and in my usual wandering manner I see that I have meandered from the point and quite forgotten what she did look like. What I saw was this. I saw that the steamer had been hit forward on the starboard side. The upper portion of the stem piece was almost down to the water level. Her foremost hold was obviously filling rapidly. Her stern was high out of the water, the red ensign of England flapping impotently on the ensign's staff. Her propeller, which was still slowly revolving, thrashed the water, and this heightened the impression that I was watching the struggles of a dying animal. The propeller was revolving in spasmodic jerks, due, I imagine, to the fast-failing steam only forcing the cranks over their dead centers with an effort. A boat was being lowered with haste from the two davits abreast the funnel on one side, but when she was full of men, and, due to the angle of the ship, well down by the bow, someone inboard let go the foremost fall, or else it broke for the bows of the boat fell downwards, and half a dozen figures were projected in grotesque attitudes into the sea. For a few seconds the boat swung backwards and forwards like a pendulum. When she came to rest, hanging vertically downwards from the stern, I noticed that a few men were still clinging like flies to her thwarts. Truly, anything is better than the Atlantic in winter. Meanwhile the ship had ceased to sink as far as outward signs went. I mentioned this to von Weissmann, who was at my side with a slight smile on his face, amused, doubtless, at the eagerness with which I watched every detail of this, to me, novel tragedy. He answered me that I need not worry, that she was being supported by an airlock somewhere forward, that the water was slowly creeping into her, and her boilers would probably soon go. This remarkable man was absolutely correct. There was an interval of about five minutes, during which another boat, evidently successfully lowered from the other side, came round her stern, picked up one or two men from the water, and also collected the survivors in the hanging boat. Then the steamer suddenly sank another two feet. There was a dull rumbling, as of heavy machinery falling from a height, a muffled report, a cloud of steam and smoke, a sucking noise, and then a pool in the water in the middle of which odd bits of wood and other buoyant debris kept on bobbing up. 
nothing else. No, I am wrong. There were two other things, a U-boat, representing the might of Germany, and a whaler with perhaps twenty men in it, representing the plight of England. As she went I felt hushed and solemn. It was an impressive moment. A slight chuckle came from imperturbable Weissman. He had seen too many go to think much of it, and he gave an order for the helm to be put over, so that we might approach the whaler. They were horribly overcrowded, and were engaged in trying to sort themselves into some kind of order. We passed by them at fifty yards, and Weissman, seizing his megaphone, shouted in English, "Goodbye. Steer west for America. A cold horror gripped my heart. It was an awful moment. I dare not write the thoughts that entered my head. I turned away my head and faced aft, that he should not see my face. Looking back I saw the whaler rocking dangerously in our wash, and then a commotion took place in her stern, from which a huge bearded man arose, and, shaking his fist in our direction, shouted something or other before his companions pulled him down. Von Weissmann heard, and his lips narrowed in. I held my breath in suspense, but he evidently decided against what he had been about to do, for with the order, Course North, Ten Knots, he went below. I remained on deck watching the rapidly receding whaler through my glasses, until she was a mere speck, alone on the ocean, a hundred and fifty miles from land. Then the navigator came up, and with strangely mixed feelings of exultant joy and depressing sorrow, I went below. Von Weissmann was in the wardroom. I watched him unobserved. He was humming a tune to himself, and had just completed putting a green dot on the chart. This done, he lay back on the settee and closed his eyes. Strange, insoluble man! For long hours I could not forget that whaler. I see it now as I write. I suppose I shall get used to it all. What would Zoe say? The most wonderful thing about man is that he can stand the strain of his own invention of modern war. Section 6 of The Diary of a U-Boat Commander I am rather tired tonight, but must just jot down briefly what has taken place today, as there is never any time in the daylight hours. Soon after dawn, at about 8 a.m., we sighted a fair-sized steamer of about 3,000 tons, which we sunk, but I cannot say what she looked like, or whether any one escaped, as we never came to the surface at all, von Weissmann sighting smoke on the western horizon just as he hit her. We accordingly steered in that direction. However, I think she went almost at once, as von Weissmann put a dot, black, on the chart as we made towards number three. I very much wanted to know whether there were any survivors, but I did not like to ask him at the time, and he has been in such an infernal temper ever since that I haven't had a suitable opportunity. The cause of his rage was as follows. Steamer number three turned out to be a fine fat chap, of the clan line, von Weissmann said, when we first sighted her. We moved in to attack and fired our port bow tube. I waited in vain by the tubes for the expected explosion. Nothing happened, but after a couple of minutes a snarl came down the voice pipe. Surface! Gun action stations! I ran aft and found the captain white with rage. Mr. Head, he said with intense feeling, I'll have to use that confounded gun. In about three minutes the captain and myself were on the bridge and the crew were at their stations round the gun. For the first time I saw the ship. She was stern on, and apparently painted with black and white stripes. As I examined her through glasses, she was distant about three thousand yards. I saw a flash aboard her, and a few seconds later a projectile moaned overhead, and fell about six thousand yards over. So she is armed, thought I, and she has actually opened fire on us first. The effect of this unexpected retort on the part of the Englishman was to throw Weissman into a paroxysm of rage. "'Why don't you fire? What the devil are you waiting for?' etc., etc., were some of the remarks he flung at the gun-crew. I did not consider it advisable to mention to him that they were probably waiting his order to fire, 
and also his orders for range and deflection, as I had imagined that, here as everywhere else, an officer controls the gunfire. Apparently in this boat it is not so, as Weissman takes so little interest in his gun that he affects to be, or else actually is, ignorant of the elements of gun control. At any rate, under the lash of his tongue, the gun's crew soon got into action, the gun-layer taking charge. Our first shot was short, very considerably so, as was also the second. Meanwhile the steamer had been keeping up a very creditably controlled rate of fire, straddling us twice, but missing for deflection, as was natural considering that we were bows on to her. I felt thoroughly in my element listening to the significant wail of the enemy's shell, punctuated by the ear-splitting report of our own gun. Weissman, gripping the rail with both hands, and to my surprise ducking when one went overhead, watched the target with a fixed expression, but made no attempt to control our gunfire, which was far from creditable, as is inevitable when it is left to the mercy of the inferior intellect of a seaman. However, at the tenth or eleventh round we hit her in the upper works, as was shown by a bright red and yellow flash near her funnel. This did not check her firing or speed in the least, in fact she seemed to be gaining on us. She also began to zigzag slightly and throw smoke-bombs overboard, which were not so effective from her point of view as I had thought they would be. Matters were thus for some minutes. We had just hit her aft for the second time, though the shooting was so disgustingly bad that I was about to ask whether I might do the duties of control officer, when there was a blinding flash, and the air seemed to fill with moaning fragments. When I had recovered from my relief from finding that I was personally uninjured, I observed that two of the gun's crew were wounded and one was lying, either killed or seriously wounded, on the casing. We had been hit in the casing, well forward, and as was subsequently proved when we dived, little material damage was caused to the boat. This enemy success caused a temporary cessation of fire. The two wounded men were cautiously making their way aft to the conning tower, and I called for a couple of stokers to come up and carry away the third, when von Weissmann suddenly gave the order to dive. The gun's crew at once made a rush for the conning tower, and were down the hatch in a trice, one of the wounded men fainting at the bottom. I was unaware as to the reason of this order to dive, and thought that perhaps the captain had sighted a periscope. As I was turning to precede him down the conning tower hatch, I distinctly saw the man lying by the gun lift his hand. I felt I could not leave him there, and instinctively cried, He is still alive! But von Weissmann, who was urging the crew to hurry down the hatch, pressed the diving alarm as soon as the last sailor was half in the hatch. I knew that this meant that the boat would be under in thirty to forty seconds, so I had no alternative but to get down the hatch as quickly as possible. I did so with reluctance, and I was followed by von Weissmann, who joined me in the upper conning tower. I forced myself not to look out of the conning tower scuttles during the few seconds that elapsed as the casing slowly went under, until at last nothing but waving green water showed at each little window. I feared that, if I had looked, I would have seen a wounded man, stung into activity by the cold touch of the Atlantic. Perhaps von Weissmann read my thoughts, or else he remembered my remark concerning the man, for he turned to me, and in level tones said, "'Have you any doubt that he was dead?' I hesitated a moment, and he continued, "'By my direction you have no doubt. He was.' How brutal! war is, and what a perfect exponent of the art the captain proves himself to be. To me a life is a life, a particle of the thing divine. To him a life is a unit, and a half-maimed and probably dying seaman is as nothing in the scales when the safety of a U-boat is at stake. The seamen are numbered in their tens of thousands, the U-boats in their tens. The steamer had hit us once luckily only in the casing. A second hit might well have punctured the pressure hull, and our fate in these waters would have been certain. Therefore, having summed these things up and balanced them in his mind, he dived, and the sailor died. 
Once below water von Weissmann seemed more his imperturbable self, and unless I am mistaken he is never really happy on the surface, at least when in action. He is a true water mole. New Entry A day full of interest, though once again I have to force myself to absorb the horrors of war. I imagine that I am now going through the experiences of a new arrival on the western front, who feels a desire to shudder at the sight of every corpse. At ten a.m. this morning we sighted the topsails of a sailing boat to the southwest. Closing her on the surface, we approached to within about six thousand meters, when suddenly von Weissmann ordered gun action stations. The gun crew came tumbling up, but not quick enough to suit him for as they were mustering at the gun he gave the order to dive, only, however, taking her down to periscope depth before instantly ordering surface, and then gun-action stations, again. This time we opened fire on the ship, which was a Norwegian bark, and, being in the barred zone, liable to destruction. Von Weissmann had announced overnight that at the first opportunity he would give that gun's crew a belly full of practice and he certainly did. As soon as the first shot was fired, she backed her topsails, and when our fourth shot struck her, somewhere near the foot of the foremast, her crew could be seen hastily abandoning their ship. This action on their part had no influence with von Weissmann, who had taken personal charge of the helm, and, with the engines running at three-quarter speed, he was zigzagging about, to make it harder for the gun's crew. Every now and then he flung a jibe at the crew, such as suggesting that they should go back to the high seas fleet and learn how to shoot. The sailing ship was soon on fire, for, considering the circumstances, the shooting was very fair, though had I been controlling it I could have confidently guaranteed better results. When she was blazing nicely fore and aft, von Weissmann ordered the practice to cease, and sent the crew below. He then ordered course south speed ten knots, and I took over the watch. An hour and a half later, when the navigator gave me a spell, a black cloud on the northern horizon marked the funeral pyre of another of our victims. When I went below, the captain had just finished playing with his precious old chart. New Entry We received a message at 2 a.m. last night from Heligoland to return forthwith. It is now 2 a.m., and we are approaching the redoubtable Dover Barrage. We had no trouble coming up channel today, which seems singularly empty, at any rate in mid-channel, where we are. New Entry We got back about three hours ago, and as I was appointed temporary to the boat, von Weissmann kindly allowed me to leave her and come up to Bruges as soon as we got into the shelters at Zeebrugge. I got up here just in time for a late dinner. Hunger satisfied, I retired to my room, and, needless to say, at once rang up my darling Zoe. By the mercy of Providence she was in, but imagine my sensations when I heard that accursed swine of a colonel was also back from the front, and expected in at the flat at any moment, being then, she thought, engaged in his after-dinner drinking bouts at the cavalry officers' club. I could only groan. A laugh at the other end stung me to furious rage. Appeased in an instant by her soothing tones, as she told me that I should be glad to hear that he was only up from the Somme on a four days' leave, and was returning next morning by the eight a.m. troop train. Glad! I could have danced for joy. I breathed again. As the Colonel was expected back at any moment, she thought it advisable to terminate the conversation which was done with obvious reluctance on her part, or so I flatter myself. He goes to-morrow, so far so good, but what of the intervening period? Could any more refined torture be imagined than that I, who love her as I love my own soul, should have to sit here, while scarcely a mile away, probably at this very moment as I write, that gross brute is privileged to kiss her, to look at her, to— oh. It's unbearable. When I think of that hog, for though I've never seen him, I've seen his photograph, and I know instinctively that he is gross, fresh, as she says, from a drinking bout, 
should at this moment be permitted to raise his pig's eyes and look into those glorious wells of violet light, when I think that his is the privilege to see those masses of black hair fall in uncontrolled splendour, then I understand to the full the deep pleasures of murder. I would give anything to destroy this man, and could shake the Englishman by the hand who fires the delivering bullet. Steady, steady. What do I write? No, I mean it, every word of it. Yet of all the mysteries, and to me Zoe is a mass of them, surely the strangest of all is contained in the question, why does she live with him? She doesn't love him. She's practically told me so. In fact, I know she doesn't. Let me reason it out by logic. She lives with him, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. Suppose it be voluntarily, then her reasons must be a. Love b. Fascination c. Some secret reason. If she is living with him involuntarily, it must be d. He has a hold on her e. For financial reasons. I strike out at once A and E, for in the case of E she knows well that I would provide for her, and A I refuse to admit. B is hardly credible, I eliminate that. I am left with C and D, which might be the same thing. But what hold can he have on her? She can't have a past, she is too young and sweet for that. I must find out about this before I go to sea again. New Entry Three days ago I was racking my brains for the solution of a problem, and as I see from what I wrote I was somewhat outside myself. In the interval things have taken an amazing turn. I am still bewildered, but I must put it all down from the beginning. The Colonel left as she said he would, and I went round to lunch with her. We had a delightful tete-a-tete, -tete, and after lunch she played the piano. I was feeling in splendid voice, and she accompanied me to perfection in Kaichowski's To the Forest, always a favourite of mine. As the last chords died away, Zoe jumped up from the piano and, with eyes dancing with excitement, placed her hands on my shoulders and exclaimed, "'Carl, I have an idea. I shall make a prisoner of you for two or three days.' I laughed heartily, and almost told her that she had already made me a prisoner for life only I can never get those sort of remarks out quick enough. But when she said, No, I am not joking, I mean it, I felt there was some more meaning in her sentence than I had at first thought. I begged to be enlightened, and she then unfolded her scheme. She told me for the first time that in a forest not far from Bruges she had a little summer-house, to which she used to retreat for weekends in the hot weather when the Colonel was away. He knew nothing of this country house. She was very insistent on that point, so I imagined she paid for it out of her dress allowance or in some other way. The idea that had just struck her was that she had a sudden fancy to go and spend two days there, and I was to go with her. I was ready to go to Africa with her if my leave permitted, and it so happened that I was due for four days overseas leave, limited to Belgian territory so that this fitted in very well, and I told her so. She was delighted then, with one of those quick intuitions which women are so clever at. She read the half-formed thought on my mind, and said, You mustn't think it's not going to be conventional. Old Babette will be with us to chaperone me. Old Babette is an aged female whom she calls her maid. I think she is jealous of me. I agreed at once that of course I quite understood it was to be highly conventional, etc., though I smiled to myself as I visualized my mother's shocked face and uplifted hands as she heard my Zoe's ideas on the conventions. I was trying to fathom what was at the bottom of it all when she remarked, "'Of course, as my prisoner, you will have to obey all my orders.' I replied that this was certainly so. "'And one of the first things,' she continued, that happens to a prisoner when he goes through the enemy lines is that he is blindfolded, and in the same way I shan't let you know where you are going. Seeing a doubtful look in my eyes, as I endeavoured to keep pace with the underlying idea, if any, of this truly feminine fancy, 
she suddenly came up to me and, lifting her eyes to mine, murmured, "'Don't you trust me?' In a moment my passion flared up, and rained hot kisses on her face as she struggled to release herself from my arms. When I left that night after dinner, and, walking on air, returned to the mess, it was arranged that I should be at her flat with my suitcase at six p.m. the next evening, prepared, to use her own words, to disappear with me for forty-eight hours. She had told me of an address in Bruges which she said would forward on any telegram if I was recalled, and I had to be satisfied with that, for I may as well say here that I never discovered where I went to, and I don't know to this moment in what part of Belgium I spent the last two nights. I tried to find out at first, but as she obviously attached some importance to keeping the locality of her woodland retreat a secret, probably to circumvent the colonel, I soon gave up trying to get the secret from her, and contented myself with taking things as they came. To go on with my account of what happened, which was really so remarkable that I propose writing it out in detail, to the best of my memory. At six p.m. next day I was naturally at her flat, feeling very much as if I were on the threshold of an adventure. Zoe was excited, and the flat was in a turmoil, as apparently she had only just begun to pack her dressing case. Soon after six we went down and got into a large Mercedes car which I had noticed standing outside when I arrived. We were soon on our way, and left Bruges by the eastern barrier. We showed our passes, and proceeded into the darkened countryside. We had been running for about a mile when she remarked, "'Prisoners will now be blindfolded,' and, to my astonishment, slipped a little black silk bag over my head. I was so startled I didn't know whether to be angry, or to laugh, or what to do. Eventually I did nothing, and, entering into the spirit of the game, declared that even a wretched prisoner had the right not to be stifled whereupon she lifted the lower portion of the bag and uncovered my mouth. Shortly afterwards I was electrified to feel a pair of soft lips meet mine, a sensation which was repeated at frequent intervals, and as I whispered in her ear, under these conditions I was prepared to be taken prisoner into the jaws of hell. This pleasant journey had lasted for about three-quarters of an hour, when my mask was removed, and I was informed that I was inside the enemy lines. Through the windows of the car I could dimly see that an apparently endless mass of fir-trees were rushing past on each side. This state of affairs continued for a kilometre or so, when we branched to the right and soon entered a large clearing in the forest, at one side of which stood the house. Babette, Zoe, and myself entered the building, and the car disappeared, presumably back to Bruges. The house, built of logs, was of two stories. On the ground floor were two living rooms, and the domains of Babette, who amongst her other accomplishments turned out to be not only a most capable valet, but a first-class cook. On the second story there were two large rooms. The whole house was furnished after the manner of a hunting lodge, with stag's heads on the walls and skins on the floors. In the drawing-room there was a piano and a few etchings of the wild boar by Chaffane. I dressed for dinner in my smoking, though under ordinary circumstances I should have considered this rather formal, but I was glad I did, for she appeared in full evening tenure. She wore a violet gown, and across her forehead a black satin bandeau with a Z in diamonds upon it. It must have cost two thousand marks and I wondered with a dull kind of jealousy whether the Colonel had given it to her. I cannot remember of what we talked during dinner. We have a hundred subjects in common, and we look at so many aspects of the world through the same pair of eyes. I only know that when I have been talking to her for a period, there is no exact measurement of time for me when I am with her. I leave her presence feeling completed. I feel that a sort of gap within my being has been filled, that a spiritual hunger has been satisfied, that I have got something which I wanted, but for which I could not have formulated the desire in words. I had resolved that on this first night I would bring matters between us to a head, and end this delicious but intolerable uncertainty as to how we stood. Yet, 
when old Babette had served us with coffee in the drawing-room, as I call the second living-room, and we were alone together, I could not bring up the subject. Partly because I think she prevented me so doing by that skilful shepherding of the conversation into other paths, with an artfulness with which God endows all women, and also partly because I could not screw myself up to the pitch. I could not, or rather would not, put my fate to the touch. I had a presentiment that in reaching for the summit I might fall from the slope. Alas! How true was this foreboding in some senses! But I will keep all things in their right order. Let it only be recorded that when she kissed me good-night, with the tenderness of a mother, and left me to smoke a final cigar, I had said nothing, and I could only wonder at the strange fate that had placed me practically alone with a girl whom I had grown to love with a deep emotion, and who appeared to love me, yet often behaved as if I were her brother. The next day we were like two children. The snow was deep on the ground, and the fir-trees stood like thousands of sentinels in grey uniform round the clearing. Once during the afternoon, as with Zoe's assistance I was furiously chopping wood for the fire, a droning noise made me look up, and thousands of meters overhead a small squadron of aeroplanes, evidently bound for the western front, sailed slowly across the sky. I thought how awkward it would be for them if they experienced an engine failure whilst over the forest, though they were up so high that I imagined they could have glided ten kilometers, and as I think, but I am not certain, and I have pledged myself not to try and find out, we were in the forest of Montellan, which is barely fifteen kilometers broad. I suppose they could have fallen clear of the trees. As a matter of fact, I imagine they would have used our clearing. I'm glad they didn't. That night after dinner she played to me, first Beethoven, and then Chopin. I can see her as I write. She had just finished the fourteenth prelude, and resting her chin on her hand, she smiled mysteriously at me. The hour had come, and, driven by strong impulses, I spoke. I told her that I loved her as I had never thought that a man could love a woman. I told her that I longed to shield her and protect her, and above all things to remove her from the clutches of that bestial colonel. And as I bent over her and felt my senses swim in the subtleties of her perfume, I begged her passionately to say the word that would give me the right to fight the world on her behalf. When I had finished, she was silent for a long while, and I can remember distinctly that I wondered whether she could hear the thump, thump, thump of my heart, which to my agitated mind seemed to beat with the strength of a hammer. At length she spoke. Two words came slowly from her lips. I cannot. I was not discouraged. I could see. I could feel that a tremendous struggle was raging, the outward signs of which were concealed by her averted head. At length I asked her point-blank whether she loved me. Her silence gave me my answer, and I took her unresisting body into my arms, and kissed her to distraction. Oh, these kisses! How bitter they seem to me now! And yet how I longed to hold her once again! For, freeing herself from my embrace, and speaking almost mechanically, she said, Carl, I must tell you, I cannot marry you. I pleaded, I prayed, I argued, I demanded. It was in vain. I always came up against the immovable. I cannot. And then I crashed over the precipice towards whose edge I had been blindly going. I had said for the hundredth time, But you know you love me when with a sob she abandoned all reserve, and flinging her arms round my neck, implored me to take her. Then, as I caught my breath, she quickly said, as if frightened that she had gone too far, But I cannot marry you. I looked down into those beautiful eyes, and for the first time I understood. For perhaps ten seconds I battled for my soul and the purity of our love, then, tearing my sight from those eyes which would lure an archangel to destruction, I was once more master of my body. 
as my resolution grew, I hated her for doing this thing that had wrecked in an instant the hopes of months, the ideals on which I had begun to build afresh my life. She felt the change, and left me. As she went out by the door she gave me one last look, a look in which love struggled with shame, a look which no man has ever earned the right to receive from any woman. But I was as a statue of marble, dazed by this calamity. As the door closed upon her I started forward. It was too late. Had she waited another instant, but there I write of what has happened and not what might have been. I did not sleep that night, until the dawn began to separate each fir-tree from the black mass of the forest. Twice in the night, with shame I confess it, I opened my door and looked down the little passageway, and twice I closed the door and threw myself upon my bed in an agony of torment. It was ten o'clock when a knock at the door aroused me, and the sunlight through the window-pane was tracing patterns on the floor. There was a note on the breakfast-table, but before I opened it I knew that, save for Babette, I was alone in the house. The note was brief, unaddressed, and unsigned. I have it here before me. I have meant to tear it up, but I cannot. It is a weakness to keep it, but I have lost so much in the last few days that I will not grudge myself some small relic of what has been. The note says, I am leaving for Bruges at half-past eight, when the car was ordered to fetch us back. I go alone. Babette will give you breakfast. The car will return for you at eleven o'clock. I rely on your honour, in that you will not observe where you have been. Come to me when you want me. Till then, farewell." It was as she said, and I honourably acceded to her request. This afternoon, just before lunch, I arrived at Bruges, and since tea-time I have tried to write down what has happened since I left the day before yesterday. Oh! How could she do it? How can it be possible that she is a woman like that? I could have sworn that she was not like this, and yet how can I account for her life with the Colonel? There must be some reason, but in heaven's name what? Meanwhile I am to go to her when I want her, and that will be when I can give her my name. But, oh, Zoe, I want you now, so badly, oh, so badly.